How many of you saw this? This was an article in Business Week. It came out about uh, three or four weeks ago. And it was a response to a trial that's been going on called ENHANCE. ENHANCE is an acronym for about 12 long words. But this was the ENHANCE trial. And it was comparing uh, two cholesterol-lowering regimes. One was with uh, a statin drug and one was with the same drug combined with uh, another cholesterol-lowering drug. And what they found was that it didn't make any difference how lower, low you lowered your cholesterol. They were looking at the thickening of the arteries and either way the arteries thickened the same amount. And this has sent a little shiver of panic through the industry, which is gearing up to put everyone on cholesterol-lowering drugs. Uh, diabetics, the elderly, women, and even children. So a little shiver of, of fear has gone through this industry. And what's so interesting to me is that the article about it appeared in not medical journal, but Business Week. Business Week. This is big business. So what we're going to do tonight is explore a little bit of history and look at the premise for all of this cholesterol lowering and low-fat diets. According to what I call the diet dictocrats, the self-appointed watchdogs in the medical industry and our government, the reason that we have so much heart disease today compared to a hundred years ago is because we've become a bad, indulgent people eating lots of terrible, saturated animal fats. And we did not used to do this. We did not used to eat these terrible animal fats. But now we're richer and more complacent and we have become very indulgent. According to the diet dictocrats, these saturated fats are new to the human diet and that's why we have so much heart disease, cancer, and other diseases today. In fact, a recent book called The Paleolithic Diet or The Paleo Diet Plan bases dietary recommendations on an interpretation of the diet of our so-called Paleolithic ancestors. According to the author, the cavemen were very politically correct and although they did eat meat, they didn't eat those terrible saturated fats that come with meat. They just threw all that away. <laughs> and the kind of fats they ate were the healthy recommended fats and the book contains recipes featuring canola and olive oil. <laughs> Before we get started, as a very general guide for newcomers, uh, let's just go over the terminology that we use for fats and oils. Saturated fats are fats that tend to be solid at room temperature. So this would be butter, ghee, uh, beef tallow, lard, which is pork fat, uh, coconut oil, and palm oil. These are the saturated fats and they are solid at room temperature. Monounsaturated oils tend to be liquid at room temperature, but they become solid when they are refrigerated. Olive oil, peanut oil, and canola oil are monounsaturated oils. Polyunsaturated oils are liquid even when they're refrigerated. Corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, and sunflower oil are polyunsaturated oils. Okay, let's go back now a hundred years and look at how Americans were eating at the time. I have a cookbook published in 1895, put together by the Baptist Ladies of Monmouth, Illinois. You couldn't find a more representative group of people at the time. And this, they put the recipes together and sold the book as a fundraiser for their church. So we know that the people use, uh, were actually eating this way. This isn't something it was made up by a dietitian. Now this collection of recipes from the turn of the century is very interesting because it completely flies in the face of what our diet dictocrats are telling us. Uh, that the reason we have so much cancer and heart disease compared to a century ago is because we are eating much greater levels of saturated fats from animal foods. Yet in this little cookbook, 
There's hardly a recipe that does not contain butter, eggs, cream, or lard, beginning with the soup chapter and ending with the substantial array of desserts. Most meat recipes call for gravy made with the drippings and occasionally with added cream. Now one interesting thing about the way people ate in 1895 is it seems that no one had heard of al dente vegetables, lightly steamed vegetables. All the vegetables in the recipes are cooked a long time and many call for sauce based on cream. In fact, it seems like the vegetables are just an excuse to have a sauce. <laughs> <laughs> the vegetable recipes include asparagus dressed in cream, four versions of cabbage with cream sauce, corn and eggplant fritters fried in lard, potato balls fried in good drippings, and parsnips fried in bacon fat. <laughs> One of the things that foreign visitors to America noted in the 1700s and 1800s was that Americans were a butter-eating nation. We ate huge amounts of butter compared to Europeans. Er, observers stated that in America everything was swimming in butter including porridge, soup, meat, vegetables, and puddings. We had a very rich land and we were a dairy nation and no one was there to tell us that butter was bad for us. So we ate lots and lots of butter. It tasted good, so why not? Seafood recipes in the little book from 1895 include fish a la creme, scalloped fish, creamed salmon, and creamed fish. The sauce for broiled fish calls for one large spoonful of butter and one and a half cups of cream. Another very interesting thing about this book was, is that there's a whole chapter devoted to oysters. Americans ate lots of oysters a hundred years ago compared to today, two or three times as many oysters per person. In the Midwest, they were either brought in on ice by train to Chicago or they came in canned from the Chesapeake Bay. Recipes for oysters include deviled oysters made with egg yolks, creamed oyster patties made with eggs and butter, oysters wrapped in bacon, scalloped oysters, oyster pie made with one quart of cream. <laughs> oyster fritters fried in drippings, oysters fried in hot lard, and scalloped oysters made with butter and whole milk. There is a chapter on organ meats which includes fried veal liver <coughs> and sweetbreads both creamed and fried. A scrapple recipe calls for hog's head, heart, tongue, and part of the liver which was stored in a crock and covered with melted lard. Scrapple was consumed for breakfast, sliced and fried in lard. Good way to start the day. And then there are separate uh, chapters for eggs and cheese. Well, let's turn to the salad recipes. What kind of salads were they eating back in 1895? There's only one salad recipe that calls for lettuce when available. Lettuce is a modern luxury and in the past people only had lettuce during certain periods of the year. And this leads to my own particular theory about the ca cause of heart disease. It's caused by lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> you may laugh at this, but this conclusion is even more pre preposterous than the conclusion that, conclusion that saturated fat and cholesterol cause heart disease. And actually, there is a very good explanation for why lettuce causes heart disease, which we will get to later on. The other salad recipes feature apples, cabbage, ham, tongue, chicken, oysters, fruit, potatoes, veal, lobster, sweetbreads, shrimp, and nasturtiums. The recipes for salad dressing are what is of greatest interest to our argument. The dressing for coleslaw features sweet cream, Three recipes for salad dressing contain egg yolk, mustard, and vinegar. One recipe calls for olive oil or melted butter. So if they didn't have olive oil, which they probably didn't, they put melted butter on their salad. Then there's another recipe that calls for one cup of whipped cream. So you can see the salads, just like the vegetables, were an excuse for animal fats. Now there is one salad dressing recipe in this book that calls for oil. This is the only time in the book that the word oil appears by itself. Americans at the turn of the century nourished themselves with butter, cream, egg yolks, and lard. They were not using vegetable oils. 
the presses for uh, removing these oils from the seeds were only just invented at that time and these oils hadn't made their way to the grocery stores in Monmouth, Illinois. In addition to eggs, butter, cream, lard, suet, which is beef fat, and other animal fats like chicken and duck fat, coconut meat and coconut oil supplied additional saturated fatty acids in turn of the century diets. Highly saturated coconut oil was used for crackers and baked goods. Now the Baptists and their families were fond of rich desserts. Half the book is devoted to cakes, pies, ice cream, pudding, and donuts. And the donuts are fried in lard, of course. Two advertisements for dentists at the back of the book testify to the effect of sugar and white flour on their teeth. But cancer and heart disease were extremely rare before the turn of the century. People were sturdy and strong, but obesity was not a problem. Today, however, we are being told that saturated fats from animal sources and from the tropical oils are the cause of cancer, heart disease, and obesity. Vegetable oils are being used as a substitute in everything from baked goods to baby food. So what we're going to do this evening is focus on how this change came about, how it was that Americans traded animal fats for vegetable oils. And the title of this tall tale is The Oiling of America. Now let's move forward to 1921. 1921 is the date of the first recorded myocardial infarction in the United States. Myocardial infarction is the scientific term for a heart attack. Uh, that was the first recorded one in 1921. By 1930, there were about 3,000 deaths in the United States from heart attack. And by 1960, that had jumped to uh, half a million deaths from myocardial infarction. So something was going on here. This was a new disease. And in the space of just 40 years, it had become an epidemic. What was causing the myocardial infarctions? There were two theories that were put forward. Uh, one was put forward by people studying eating patterns in the United States, and they had noticed that Americans were eating far fewer animal fats, they were eating uh, fewer eggs, and, they, and, and more of the vegetable oils, especially the oils that had been hardened by a process called partial hydrogenation, uh, to resemble the saturated animal fats. And so their theory was that these new types of oils were causing this epidemic and that we should go back to the way we ate before. Well, that's a pretty reasonable theory. But there was another theory that was put forward called the diet heart theory or the lipid hypothesis. And this theory said that we were a bad, indulgent, sinful people and we were eating far too much cholesterol and saturated fat from animal foods, from animal fats. And this bad diet led us to have uh, cholesterol levels in the blood that were too high. And when our cholesterol was high, that led to atherosclerosis, the buildup of plaque in the arteries, the, the blocking off of the artery. And that was what led to coronary heart disease, especially the myocardial infarction. So the overall theory said that this bad diet with all these animal fats and cholesterol was causing this new epidemic of heart disease. If you have a theory in science, the burden of proof is on you. And if something comes along that disproves that theory, you need to come up with a new theory. You have to go back to the drawing board and come up with a new theory. And as a matter of fact, as early as 1936, a, a paper was published that completely disproved the lipid hypothesis. This was published by a couple of pathologists, Landy and Sperry, in 1936. And what they did was look at cholesterol levels and artery blockage in people who had died sudden death. And what they found was no correlation. There were people who had very low levels of cholesterol with lots of artery blockage, and there were people who had high levels of cholesterol with very little artery blockage. Basically, it was all over the map and there was no pattern that emerged from their study. So this part of the theory was disproven as early as 1936. 
That did not stop the proponents of the diet heart theory, however, and uh, you might be interested to know who was the organization or what, which organization was promoting this theory. It was none other than the American Heart Association, which was actually founded to promote the diet heart theory. By 1956, the American Heart Association had become so prominent that they were able to organize a fundraiser which aired on all three television networks at the same time. The program featured medical doctors promoting uh, the lipid hypothesis as the cause of heart disease and suggesting that Americans adopt the prudent diet, the prudent diet. The prudent diet was one in which corn oil, margarine, chicken, and cold cereal replace butter, lard, beef, eggs, and oatmeal with cream. Now this ca campaign was not an unqualified success for the American Heart Association because one of the panelists was Dr. Paul Dudley White. Uh, Dr. White is considered the father of modern cardiology he introduced the electrocardiogram to America and he was President Eisenhower's personal physician. On public television, he noted that heart disease in the form of myocardial infarction was non-existent in 1900 when egg consumption was three times what it was in 1956 and when corn oil was unavailable. When pressed to support the prudent diet, Dr. White sa said, See here, I began my practice as a cardiologist in 1921, and I never saw an MI patient until 1928. Back in the MI-free days before 1920, the fats were butter and lard, and I think we would all benefit from the kind of diet we had at that time when no one had heard the word corn oil. Unfortunately, Dr. White's uh, wise words were soon forgotten. And the next step, step in this saga was the formation of something called the Anti-Coronary Club in New York. It was led by Dr. Norman Jolofi, director of the Nutrition Bureau of the New York Health Department. What he did was place a group of businessmen ages 40 to 59 on the prudent diet. The Anti-Coronary Club members used corn oil and margarine instead of butter, cold breakfast cereal instead of eggs, and chicken and fish instead of beef. They were to be compared with a matched group of the same age that, who ate eggs every morning and had meat three times a day. The results came in in 1966. They were published in a medical journal. And if you were to get this journal and uh, look at it, the first thing you would see is the abstract or the, the summary of what is in this uh, study. And if you read the abstract, you would think that this prudent diet was very successful because the men on the prudent diet had an average cholesterol level of 220, whereas the control group had an average cholesterol level of 250. If you read the whole article, which many doctors uh, don't do, they just read the abstracts, and got to the very end, you'd find a paragraph that was in very small print, so small that you'd have to put your reading glasses on to read this. You might think it was a footnote to this article. And if you read that paragraph, you would find out that the men on the prudent diet who had lower cholesterol had eight deaths from heart attack during the period of the study. And the men who were not on the prudent diet who had higher cholesterol had no deaths from heart attack during the study. So here we have the anti-coronary club. Eight deaths from heart disease among the prudent dieter group and none among the controls. Well, by this time you may be asking yourself, who is behind this? What is pushing this diet heart theory if the early studies were so negative and uh, didn't support the theory at all? The, the group behind this diet heart theory was the industry that had the most to gain. This was the edible oil industry this industry is a very powerful lobby in Washington, D.C., and no one has ever heard of them. Their lobbying group is called the Institute for Shortening and Edible Oils, and they have worked behind the scenes for the last 50 years to promote their product and to demonize the competition, and the competition, of course, is the animal fats. Now, the American Heart Association, although it was founded to promote the lipid hypothesis, actually at one point prepared a statement in which it warned consumers to avoid 
partially hydrogenated vegetable oils to avoid trans fats. Uh, that was in 1965, and the, um, they had printed up 150,000 of these statements. They were about to distribute them to the public when the industry found out about this. And Dr. Fred Matson of Procter & Gamble, who was a big producer of vegetable oils, uh, wrote to the American Heart Association. We ha actually have a record of this letter and told them to get rid of this statement. And that's exactly what the American Heart Association did. They destroyed all the documents and issued a new statement that removed any reference to trans fatty acids. In fact, which actually encouraged the consumption of these partially hydrogenated fats. Then during the 1960s, this industry worked behind the scenes to supervise the American Heart Association, the National L Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and the American Dietetic Association to make sure that they were promoting the vegetable oils. They made sure that people sympathetic to their point of view were on their boards of directors and were their science advisors. In 1971, it, you can see this is moving uh, right along just as if it were planned. The FDA's general counsel uh, retired and he became president of this Edible Oil Trade Association. And he was replaced at the FDA by a food lawyer, Peter Barton Hutt of Covington and Burling, who had represented the edible oil industry. So we call this the revolving door policy. And now the fox was in the hen house. The uh, very industry the FDA was supposed to pol police was now in charge. And we'll see in a moment what Peter Barton Hutt did when he went to the FDA. Then going on to the 70s and 80s, the same Fred Matson who squelched the anti-trans fat statement held two controlling positions in the lipid research clinic trials that led to the National Cholesterol Education Program. So the industry was always working behind the scenes to see that their agenda was carried out. You might be interested to know that for a long time the American Medical Association opposed the lipid hypothesis. From a news release in 1962, the association said the anti-fat, anti-cholesterol fad is not just foolish and futile, it also carries some risk. And they call this a new food fad and it should not be done without medical supervision and might be even dangerous to try. However, by the early 1970s, even the American Medical Association had come in line with the others, the American Heart Association, and the National Academy of Science. And all three organizations issued statements in the early 1970s that were virtually identical. These were official statements about diet and heart disease. The first thing these statements said was that Americans had cholesterol that was too high and that it was important for Americans to lower their cholesterol. And they called for measuring cholesterol as a routine part of physical examinations, or even in early adulthood. So we want to make uh, Americans anxious about their cholesterol levels at a very young age. We are instilling cholesterol anxiety in the population. Americans who were in the risk category should receive appropriate dietary advice. And Americans in the risk category should reduce their intake of saturated fats by substituting polyunsaturated vegetable oils. I put risk in quotation marks because they actually hadn't yet defined who was at risk. Were you at risk if your cholesterol was average at 240, or if your cholesterol was slightly high at 300, or if your cholesterol was low at 200? They hadn't decided who was at risk. Another thing that came out in these three statements was the following. Modified and ordinary foods useful for this purpose of lowering cholesterol should be readily available on the market, reasonably priced, and easily identified by appropriate labeling. Any existing legal and regulatory barriers to the marketing of such foods should be removed. And we'll see how that was done in a moment. And then they said, and this is all in the same statement, so it's kind of interesting, more studies need to be done. Always calling for more studies. D um, Dr. Ennig calls this WPA for PhDs. More studies need to be done to determine whether modification of plasma lipids, that means lowering cholesterol, 
can reduce heart disease. So you see what's going on here. They're proposing a radical change in the way Americans eat on the, on the basis of a theory that hasn't been proven yet. Well, the uh, legal and regulatory barriers to the marketing of these new types of foods was the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938. And this act basically said that if a food was an imitation food, it had to carry an imitation label. And the food processing industry did not like these regulations. They were uh, inventing new foods. They had invented something that looked like meat based on soybeans and something that looked like cream based on vegetable oils. And they did not like the imitation policy. As you remember, the lawyer, Peter Barton Hutt, went to the FDA in 1971, and by 1973, he had put into place the new FDA imitation policy. This policy attempted to provide for advances in food technology. That's who it was for. It was for the food technologists. And to give manufacturers relief from the dilemma of either complying with an outdated standard or having to label their new products as imitation. And they firmly believed what they were saying, that these products were not necessarily inferior, and so we needed to get rid of this imitation law. And the new uh, standard for the foods and the new definition of inferiority was any reduction in content of an essential nutrient that is present at a level of 2% or more of the US RDA. What that means was, if they were making an imitation cream out of vegetable oil, all they had to do was add some calcium and some synthetic vitamin A to bring it up to the level in real cream, and then it no longer had to carry the imitation label. So in one fell swoop, this opened the doors to a flood of imitation foods on the market. Americans didn't want imitation foods, especially after the war, and the regulations which required that label were a barrier to the marketing of these new foods. As soon as these new regulations were in place, uh, George McGovern, Senator McGovern, convened the Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs. This committee promoted the lipid hypothesis from the beginning. Thousands of pages of dissenting testimony were sent in, but it was completely ignored. The final report, which was written by a labor lawyer, by the way, who had no background in nutrition, claimed that USDA data showed that animal fats were the cause and vegetable oils could prevent cancer and heart disease. In fact, they said that our 10 greatest killers could be solved if Americans would just use vegetable oils and margarine instead of animal fats. It's quite amazing, really, uh, how uh, this all came, came about. Now, this was the time when my uh, co-author and colleague, Mary Ennig, was working on her PhD. And she was very familiar with USDA data and very puzzled by this report because she knew that the USDA data showed something very different. Through Freedom of Information, she obtained the data that the McGovern Committee used. And when she looked at it, she found that they had done a lot of strange things. They had left out chunks of data that would have changed the results. And they had added in one place when they should have subtracted. And basically, when she manipulated this data appropriately, she found that it showed that the people still eating animal fats had less cancer and less heart disease. And the people eating the vegetable oils and the margarines had more cancer and more heart disease. She was able to publish an article in an obscure medical journal showing what she'd found. And the article concluded by calling for more research into the trans fatty acids, which was her specialty. About three weeks after her article was published, she was called to a meeting at the University of Maryland. It was the entire uh, faculty in the lipids department, about five professors, all of the graduate students, and four representatives from the industry. There was someone from um, Unilever, um, Central Soya, Kraft Foods, and the Institute for Shortening and Edible Oils. And one of them had a stack of paper. This was before the internet, so they were clipping uh, articles. And Mary's article in the journal got a lot of publicity. There was even an article in the National Enquirer about it. 
And he was shaking with rage. They were furious that this had gotten out. And he said, you know, we watch the journals. And I thought my colleague was watching the journal that published your article, and he thought I was watching that journal. And we left the barn door open and a horse got out. And he said, this is not going to happen again. Imagine the arrogance of these people. They were controlling what was being published in the journals, and they admitted it. They were proud of it. Now, at this time, Mary and her colleagues were actually analyzing foods in the su supermarket for levels of trans fatty acids. Believe it or not, the official dietary tables of the U.S. government did not mention trans fats. Usually the trans fats were lumped in with saturated fats, and researchers using this table ended up blaming saturated fats for diseases that were being caused by the trans fats. So Mary and her colleagues were doing this market basket survey, and the industry was very unhappy about this. And they said, we know what you're doing. If you continue this research, we're going to cut off all your funding. Well, the research was continued. It was finally published. And in fact, it was incorporated into the US government databases, thankfully. Uh, but Mary and her department never got another penny, penny of funding. Uh, as the re professors retired, they were not replaced. The department was closed. And Mary herself was blackballed and never got any funding for further research. This brilliant researcher was basically just uh, closed off from the research community. So in spite of her brave efforts, the um, Senate Select Committee's report, uh, flawed as it was, continued the American dietary trends toward more vegetable oils and less animal fats. But the medical profession was still skeptical of the value of cholesterol-lowering measures. So what I want to do now is look at three major studies that you all paid for. Uh, these were paid for with tax dollars. And these are the three studies that are uh, mostly referenced in material that comes from our government promoting the lipid hypothesis. The first was the Framingham study that went on for 40 years in the town of Framingham, Massachusetts, where they were looking at risk factors for heart disease. And when the results came out, this was in 1987, they were published in a major journal in, summarized in this graph. And it does look as though if your cholesterol gets up into this level, it starts to get pretty scary. And you look like you're, uh, and it looks like you're quite at risk for heart disease uh, if your cholesterol is in this interval or higher. Now, has anyone here ever taken statistics? Or sadistics, as my son calls them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you notice something strange about this chart? If you look at the intervals, the first interval is 121 points. It goes from a cholesterol level of 84 to 204. Okay, then the next interval is 30 points, and then 30 points, and then 30 points, and the l last interval is 830 points. It goes from 295 to 1124. Now, if you had done that on your statistics test, you would have gotten an F. This is cheating. This is cheating. And this was published in the American Heart Journal. So I redrew the chart, and... Uh, I made the intervals equal, and now it looks very different, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, if your cholesterol is up here in 1,000, anybody in this room who has cholesterol levels of 1,000? <laughs> very rare. It's extremely rare. You are definitely slightly more at risk for heart disease, but not very much. It's certainly not something to get too frightened about. And as you'll notice, in, inside this circle between 185 and 285, this is basically a straight line. That means you're no more at risk if your cholesterol is 285 than if it's 185. So why are we making these huge changes in our diet? Now, in, in looking at the, the data, what you find is the actual rate of increase between cholesterol of 182 and 244 is minuscule, 0.13 percent. But a Dr. Stamler, who uh, was writing about this study in an article, said that there was a 240 percent increase in risk 
between 182 and 244. So how did they take this trivial little number here and get this big scary increase in risk? They actually invented a new, a new way of talking about statistics, something called relative risk. And here's how relative risk works. Suppose the death rate from heart disease at 240, cholesterol level of 240 is 2 per thousand, and at 160 is 1 per thousand. The difference, the rate of difference, the absolute risk is 1 one thousandth, but the difference in relative risk is 100 percent because 2 is 100 percent greater than 1. Now suppose the death rate at 240 is 2 per billion and at 160 is 1 per billion. The difference in rate is 1 billionth, but the difference in relative risk is still 100 percent because 2 is 100 percent greater than 1. Now you see what's going on here? They're getting rid of the denominator. They're not looking at the sample size. Now you may not have taken statistics, but all of you took fractions. And if you did that on your fractions test, you would have gotten an F. But they get away, from, they get away with this in heart disease research. Be very careful when you see this word risk in the newspaper articles because this is what they're doing. Usually these studies show very small differences but they can make them seem very large by using this paradigm of relative risk. And the cholesterol theory proponents usually exaggerate the benefits by reporting them in terms of relative risk and minimize the side effects by reporting them in terms of absolute risk. And a very good example of that was a, uh, the CARE trial, which was actually never published. Uh, they didn't publish this because they didn't like what they found. The relative risk of heart attacks or death from heart attack in the people taking the cholesterol lowering drug there was a a 19 percent reduction in in relative risk the absolute risk was only 1.1 percent but there was a lot of breast cancer in the women taking the the drug um, they had a 4.2 percent absolute risk increase but if you do it the way the proponents of the diet heart theory do it it was a 1500 percent increase in breast cancer risk in 1992, Dr. William Castelli, who was the director of the Framingham study, wrote in uh, a very obscure journal. He said, in Framingham, Massachusetts, and this is what they really found, the more saturated fat one ate, the more cholesterol one ate, the more calories one ate, the lower people's serum cholesterol. We found that the people who ate the most cholesterol, the most saturated fat, and the most calories weighed the least and were the most physically active. So those who were eating the animal fats had the best risk factors for heart disease. Now you didn't read that on the front pages of the New York Times, did you? This is moldering in the basements of the medical libraries. The, the second study that your tax dollars paid for was the multiple risk factor intervention trial, Mr. Fit for short, they come up with very clever names for these which involved 362,000 men and they were looking at cholesterol levels versus heart disease deaths and total deaths. And they did find that if your cholesterol was uh, high or going up as cholesterol levels were going up, the uh, deaths from heart disease also increased. It wasn't a huge increase, it went from slightly less than one per thousand to about two per thousand. However, anything that you gained from not dying of heart disease, from having low cholesterol, was more than wiped out by the huge increase in total deaths from having low cholesterol. <clears throat> the uh, total deaths were deaths from stroke, cancer, intestinal diseases, accidents, and suicide. And this is something that emerges over and over again in these studies. There is a slight improvement in heart disease deaths for lower cholesterol, but a larger number of total deaths from other causes. One of the things they found was that those who had high cholesterol and were taking blood pressure medications were the ones who were dying of heart disease. It seemed to be a very deadly combination to have high cholesterol and to be on blood cholesterol medication. They actually stopped the study early because they didn't want this correlation to become statistically significant. 
Now, in writing about this study, Dr. John LaRosa of the American Heart Association made a strange statement. He said, the curve starts to inflect after 200, cholesterol levels of 200. Now, he's talking about this line here, which is a gradually sloping line. There is no place on this line where you would suddenly decide that someone was at risk for heart disease. But he said that it was right here at 200. And you can, as you'll see, what they were doing is, is laying the stage uh, for choosing 200 as the risk point, uh, the number at which they would put everyone on cholesterol-lowering drugs. The third big study that you paid for was the Lipid Research Clinic's Coronary Primary Prevention Trial. The results were published in 1984. It was a very expensive trial that cost $150 million. This trial did not look at diets. It looked at two groups, one of which was on a cholesterol-lowering drug, and the other one was on a placebo, a type of sugar pill. In fact, all of the subjects were put on a low cholesterol, low saturated fat diet. They thought it would be unethical to allow one group to, to eat animal foods. In fact, a lot of the money for this trial was spent on dietitians who met in focus groups with all of the subjects on, in both groups and taught them how to avoid animal fats, how to use margarine instead of butter, uh, breakfast cereals instead of eggs and bacon. They were basically propagandizing for the food industry. When the results were published, the researchers claimed that the group taking the drug had a 17% reduction in the rate of heart disease. Now, Mary Ennig was on the ball and uh, looked at their results and looked at their data, and she found no difference in the de uh, rate of heart disease between those taking the cholesterol-lowering drugs and those who were not. The average cholesterol reduction was 8.5%, and this has led to a statement which you may have heard. For each 1% reduction in cholesterol, we can expect a 2% reduction in coronary heart disease events. And this is nonsense. This is junk science, but it gets a lot of people worried about their cholesterol. The group taking the drug had an increase in deaths from cancer, stroke, violence, and suicide. But this is not what was published in the media frenzy that came after this trial was published. The popular press and the medical journals portrayed this trial as the long-sought proof that animal fats are the cause of heart disease. And as you can see, this trial didn't even look at diet. Thirty years later, in 1987, they went back to the Framingham subjects and looked at them again. And what they found was that the lower their cholesterol, the greater their risk of death. Uh, in a statement in the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, we read, for each 1% drop of cholesterol, there was an 11% increase in coronary and total mortality. The other types of studies that are used to justify the diet heart theory are epidemiological studies where they look at whole populations in different countries. The most famous of these researchers was Ansel Keys, working in the 1950s. Uh, by the way, that's where we get the word K-ration, and Dr. Keyes developed the K-ration for the soldiers. He became very famous promoting the lipid hypothesis. And this was the graph that he put together for his six-country study. And as you can see, the, the the x-axis is percentage of calories from fat in these countries, and the y-axis is deaths from heart disease per thousand. And this looks pretty convincing. Uh, it really looks, um, here we have these countries with low sat fat consumption and low heart disease, and uh, then we have the countries with a lot of fat consumption and a lot of heart disease. And he, he convinced a lot of people with these types of graphs. Now, he, he, did, he cheated also, and I'm going to show you how he cheated in a minute, but first I want to just point out something. In Japan, if you die of a heart attack, you bring a lot of dishonor to your family. If you die of stroke, you bring a lot of honor to your family. And the family doctor who wants to bring honor to the family and be a doctor to honorable families, uh, naturally leans toward putting stroke on the death certificate and not heart disease. So the death certificates in all of the Asian countries are very unreliable. 
And then we have Italy, and uh, Dr. Uh, Keyes was in Italy just after the war, and he decided that the Italian diet was very low in fat. Uh, at that time, it probably was low in fat. It was actually low in food. They were basically starving. <laughs> And he obviously never had a pepperoni pizza because uh, cheese and sausage are two food items that are extremely high in fat. But just assuming that the data that he was using is correct, let me show you what Dr. Keyes did. This was the data that was available to him at the time. And now it doesn't look so convincing, does it? Basically what he did was draw the graph that he wanted and then remove the data points that didn't fit the graph. So this kind of cheating goes on a lot in epidemiological studies. One person who did it a lot was John Robbins in his books where he was arguing that meat caused disease, cancer, and heart disease. He just excluded the data points that didn't fit the nice tidy graphs that he published. Something very interesting emerged from these early epidemiological studies was country pairs. For example, in Finland, people tend to high, have very high cholesterol levels, but in West fin Finland, they have low levels of heart disease, and in a place called North Karelia, they have very high levels of heart disease. He found similar pairs in Middle Europe and Italy and Greece. Now, this was something that really needed looking into, but no one went back and did further studies. Was it the difference in soil? Was it the difference in diets, lifestyle? Uh, nobody went back to look at this very interesting um, data that emerged from these early studies. And that's a shame, because if we can't do that today, the, no one is eating uh, all local food anymore. Another epidemiological study was the Monica study. As you can see, if you eliminate China and Japan, which, uh, where we have very unreliable uh, data, not only about what people die from, but about what they're eating. Uh, there really is no correlation here. Here is France with um, high levels of uh, cholesterol and very low levels of heart disease. That's the, the French paradox there. But in a graph that was published in Swedish papers used to justify the anti-cholesterol campaign, this is how they showed the Monica study. So once again, they left off the data points that didn't fit the graph that they wanted to publish. Here's some epidemiological data from Europe. These are the European countries that have the uh, lowest consumption of saturated fat. And as you can see, several of them have very high rates of heart disease. These are the European countries that have the highest levels of saturated fat consumption. And as you can see, they have the uh, much lower levels of heart disease. Here we have France, the French paradox, very high uh, levels of saturated fat consumption, very low rates of heart disease. But we also have the Swiss paradox, the, the Dutch paradox, the Icelandic paradox, the Finnish paradox, and the Austrian paradox. All of these paradoxes. A little quote here from Galileo, by denying scientific principles, one may maintain any paradox. When you've got all these paradoxes, something is definitely wrong with the theory. All of these studies were building up to the 1984 Cholesterol Consensus Conference. Now, you may be saying, where were the critics? There were lots of critics, and their voices were becoming louder and louder. There were a lot of scientists who were appalled at what was going on. So they invited all these science, scientists to this conference. It was designed to appear objective and comprehensive, and the dissenters were allowed to speak and give talks, but their views were not included in the panel's report. Dr. Ennig was there with one of her colleagues, and the, her colleague happened to pick up somebody else's papers on the first day of the conference. And in that stack of papers was the final report for the Cholesterol Consensus Conference. So the report had been written before the conference was convened. There were just a few little numbers that they wanted to fill in. And by inviting the dis dissenters and having their names on the conference program, it made it seem as though they had finally seen the light and fallen in line 
with the diet heart theory. It was at this conference that they defined the risk point for heart disease. Um, they decided that indiv all individuals with cholesterol levels over 200 sh would be defined as at risk. Now, this was a, there was a little bit of debate about this, which Mary and her colleague happened to overhear. They were the three organizers were arguing. And two of them said, well, obviously the risk point should be 240, because that's the average. We can't make it below average. But Dr. Rifkin, who organized this conference, said, no, 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 we have to make it 200. Otherwise, we won't have enough people to test and, of course, to treat. <laughs> The conference called for mass cholesterol screening and recommended the prudent diet, low in saturated fat and cholesterol for at-risk Americans, even though no long-term studies had ever been done of such a diet. And finally, as you can well imagine, they advised the replacement of butter with margarine. Now this was national policy, national government policy that Americans were going to use margarine and vegetable oils instead of butter and animal fats. This officially launched the National Cholesterol Education Program, but the planning for this uh, educational program had actually started a year before. It was just officially announced at the conference. And the stated goal was to change physicians' attitudes. There were still many doctors who didn't subscribe to the lipid hypothesis. A large physician's kit was sent to every doctor in the United States, you paid for this, remember, uh, explaining how to test for cholesterol, how to, to treat people with cholesterol, so-called high cholesterol, what kind of diets to put people on, and started to talk about drugs for lowering cholesterol, which is not surprising since the American Pharmaceutical Association was on the coordinating committee. The dietary recommendations, no surprises here reduce cholesterol and saturated fat, and use margarine instead of butter. Now in 1990, the National Institutes of Health added something to the National Cholesterol Education Program. As you remember, when this started, the, this diet, this prudent diet, was going to be for people who were at risk, adults at risk for heart disease. But in 1990, the National Institutes of Health recommended the prudent diet for all Americans above the age of two. When your child uh, turns two and goes in for the pediatrician's two-year checkup, that's when the doctor says, now it's time to put your child on reduced fat milk, don't give them butter, cut back on the eggs, um, you, you, want to, you don't want your child to end up with heart disease. Well, there's absolutely no proof that this, is going, this type of diet is going to prevent heart disease in children. And what they're recommending is, is far more than just bad advice. This prudent diet for children is genocide. This is a genocidal diet, and it's being imposed as national policy on all of our growing children. During this period when all of this phony science was going on, there was a lot of good science going on, showing us how important the animal fats are, saturated fats are, and the vitamins carried in animal fats for growth and development. Children need uh, cholesterol and animal fats for the development of the brain and nervous system, for their bones, for their organs, and for reproduction. So the diet that's being imposed on our growing children today is leading to an epidemic of learning disorders and infertility, exactly what uh, anyone could have foreseen. Now, there's a lot of fine print here, but I want to read this to you because it shows that the people who were promoting this theory knew exactly what they were doing. This is Scott Grundy, one of the main proponents of the diet heart theory. And this was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1986. The title of the article was Cholesterol and Coronary Heart Disease, A New Era. He starts off with a very strong statement. Evidence re relating plasma cholesterol levels to atherosclerosis and coronary heart disease has become so strong as to leave little doubt of the etiologic connection, the cause and effect connection. 
The next st statement, though, um, is not quite the same as the first statement. In fact, there's kind of a contradiction here. He said, the recent consensus conference on cholesterol implied that levels between 200 and 240 carry at least a mild increase in risk, which they obviously do. It is so mild as to be trivial, but of course they have made everyone afraid by using this concept of relative risk. Then he says, if hypercholesterolemia, this is a new disease now, hypercholesterolemia, high cholesterol, is defined as a plasma cholesterol level exceeding 240 for middle-aged people, this means that 15 to 20 percent of American adults have an elevated cholesterol level. Well, duh. I mean, if that's how you've defined it. And remember that they actually defined it as 200, so it's far more than 15 percent of people are suddenly patients. <coughs> Healthy people have suddenly become patients. He calls for the simple step of measuring the plasma cholesterol level in all adults. This is creating uh, another new disease, cholesterol anxiety. Those found to have elevated cholesterol levels can be de designated as at high risk, because they're defined as being at high risk, and can thereby enter the medical care system. That's what it's all about, changing healthy people into patients by inventing a new disease, hypercholesterolemia. An enormous number of patients will be included. Yes, indeed. Continuing the same article, many physicians will see the advantages of using drugs for cholesterol lowering. They're trying to get the physicians involved here. The recent and dramatic surge of interest in cholesterol lowering drugs by the pharmaceutical industry support the belief that use of these drugs will be widely accepted by the medical community. They're getting the doctors on board here. But then he goes on to say, a positive benefit-risk ratio for cholesterol-lowering drugs will be difficult to prove. And they haven't proven it yet. In fact, they're admitting as much. Whether diet has a long-term effect on cholesterol remains to be proved. And that's absolutely true. It's still true today. They've proved nothing about diet and cholesterol levels or heart disease. But, he says, public health advocates furthermore can play an important role by urging the food industry to provide palatable choices of foods that are low in cholesterol, saturated fatty acids, and total calories. Change the way everyone eats. Finally, the demonstration that lowering the plasma cholesterol level will reduce the risk of heart disease provides a strong impetus to intervene. That's what it's all about. It's intervention into your lives in the, quote, mass hypercholesterolemia. And he's honest enough to put this in quotes because this is totally invented uh, by the industry. The mass hypercholesterolemia prevalent among Americans. Dietary modification for this purpose will likely remain the foundation of intervention. Well, you may ask, what about all the other studies? And there really are dozens and dozens of other studies that have looked into cholesterol levels and diet and heart disease. And they are very well um, described in the book by Dr. Ravenskoff, The Cholesterol Myths. I, I won't go into them all, but one of them is, is quite extraordinary, the Inter International Atherosclerosis Project, which looked at 31,000 autopsies from 15 countries and looked at cholesterol levels, looked at the diets, and they found no correlation between animal fat intake and de degree of atherosclerosis or the serum cholesterol level. Vegetarians had just as much artery blockage as meat eaters, and those with low cholesterol had just as much artery blockage as those with high cholesterol. <coughs> and there were many critics. There were dozens of critics. Usually they waited till they retired, and their, uh, so their funding wasn't jeopardized to speak out. One of them was George Mann, uh, formerly with the Framingham Project, who said the public is being deceived by the greatest health scam of the century. And Michael Gurr, who wrote the definitive lipid biochemistry textbook when he retired, he wrote, whatever causes heart disease, it is not primarily a high intake of saturated fatty acids. So there were plenty of critics, but you don't read about the, cl the critics 
in the newspapers and you don't hear about them on television. Well, we've been talking about cholesterol, so maybe we better talk about what it is. What is cholesterol? Most people think cholesterol is a fat, but it's actually more like a wax. It's a sterile molecule. It's made by almost every cell in the body. Its key role is to make cells waterproof. It's in your cell membranes, and it plays the same role that cellulose does in plants. It makes the cells, gives them a stiffness that they're supposed to have, an integrity, and it makes them waterproof so there can be a different chemistry on the inside and the outside of the cell. Uh, cholesterol is nature's healing substance. It repairs wounds. There's a lot of cholesterol in scar tissue. And it, in, it repairs tears in the arteries. If you have very weak arteries prone to tears, your body makes a lot of cholesterol as a repair substance. And blaming cholesterol, high cholesterol levels for heart disease is sort of like blaming the fireman who put out the fire. Gosh, every time we have a fire, there are firemen there, so the firemen must be causing the fires. That is the logic that's blaming cholesterol. Cholesterol is the precursor to vitamin D, which is a very important vitamin. The bile salts that your body uses for digesting fats are made from cholesterol. Important hormones are made from cholesterol, and we all hear a lot about antioxidants today. One of the most powerful antioxidants in your body is cholesterol. It protects the body against free radicals. And finally, cholesterol is essential for the development and function of the brain and nervous system and is needed for the proper function of the serotonin receptors in the brain. Now, serotonin is the body's feel-good chemical. And when your cholesterol levels are low, that feel-good chemical cannot work, and people end up being depressed or antisocial or suicidal. And this explains why over and over again in the studies we see that cholesterol lowering leads to depression. Another thing in the studies is that cholesterol lowering leads to violence, uh, not only suicide but accidents and, and violent behavior. And we also see this in animals. Uh, vicious dogs have low cholesterol compared to nice dogs. And uh, in prisons, uh, violent offenders tend to have very low cholesterol. So you can see this. It's not just something that's enriching the pharmaceutical industry or enriching the, the food industry. This is something that's causing a lot of suffering, uh, an incredible amount of suffering in our culture. Cholesterol is actually the mother of all hormones. All of the sex hormones are made out of cholesterol, estrogen, testosterone. This is why cholesterol lowering often leads to infertility and loss of libido. And these hormones here are also made out of cholesterol. These are the hormones that regulate mineral levels, blood sugar levels, that deal with healing, that regulate blood pressure, and that help you deal with stress uh, when you need to have um, cortisol and so forth. These are all made out of cholesterol. Vitamin A is required to make all of these hormones. We get vitamin A from animal fats. And the trans fats, which are, of course, the substitute for animal fats, inhibit all of these hormones. Is it any wonder that we're seeing a lot of hormonal problems in our population today? And a lot of use of prednisone. What is pre prednisone? It is the synthetic cortisol. People can't make enough cortisol to heal because they're too low in cholesterol, eating trans fats, or lacking the vitamins that they need to make this critical hormone. To summarize about cholesterol research, cholesterol levels increase naturally and gradually with age. It is normal for your cholesterol to go up as you age because you need more protection. You need more antioxidants. Your arteries are weaker, and you need more of that healing substance. It is very difficult to get an accurate reading of cholesterol. The levels vary with the amount of stress you're under, the time of day, how long ago you ate and the type of tests used. The type of tests that they use in the shopping malls tend to give a higher reading, you know, to get you into the medical system. A study with college students uh, looked at cholesterol levels every week during the year, and one week everybody's levels went sky high, and the researchers were perplexed until they realized that this was the week of midterm exams. All the students were under a lot of stress, 
and uh, their cholesterol went up so they could make hormones to deal with the stress. If they had not taken the, or if they had taken something to lower their cholesterol levels, they might not have gotten through their midterm exams. They might have freaked out under all the stress. Okay, what is the risk at the various levels? We know that men are slightly at risk for heart disease if their cholesterol levels are above 300. This is men under the age of 60. How many in this audience fit that criteria? You're, you're male, you're under 60, and your cholesterol is over 300. One, two, okay, three. Okay. Not, not many, but we've got the whole country trying to lower their cholesterol. For women, there's no appreciable difference in heart disease for cholesterol uh, levels at any level. And for the elderly, it's the same. So if you're a woman or if you're over 60, even if your cholesterol is 1,000, you're no more at risk for heart disease than if your cholesterol is at 180. And for fa in fact, for women of all ages and for the elderly, higher cholesterol is associated with a longer lifespan. The higher your cholesterol, the longer you live. And as we stated earlier, autopsy studies show zero correlation between animal fat intake, degree of atherosclerosis, and the serum cholesterol level. Well, what about LDL and HDL? Isn't LDL supposed to be the bad cholesterol and HDL is supposed to be the good cholesterol? Well, without going into details, let me just say that the evidence that LDL is bad is even weaker than the evidence for total cholesterol. And we now know in recent studies that LDL cholesterol protects against infection, especially in the elderly. Many studies have shown that all-cause deaths, especially deaths from cancer, are higher for individuals with cholesterol lower than 180. And by the way, you know, 200 is no longer the risk point. They, now they're trying to get cholesterol levels even lower. And if you've had a heart attack, even if your cholesterol is 130, and that does happen, they still put you on cholesterol-lowering drugs because obviously your cholesterol wasn't low, low enough. <laughs> the cholesterol that we get in food is not harmful. In fact, it's exactly the same substance that your body makes, and if you're eating a lot of cholesterol, you just spare the body from having to make its own cholesterol. But there is one type of cholesterol that seems to be problematic, that's oxidized cholesterol, which in some studies uh, appears to initiate the buildup of plaque in the arteries. And oxidized cholesterol comes from powdering animal foods, like powdered milk or powdered eggs. And powdered milk is added to 1% and 2% milk and low-fat dairy products, which people are drinking, thinking they are protecting their heart. And finally, the cholesterol-lowering drugs do not lower the risk of heart disease, but they do increase the risk of cancer, intestinal diseases, depression, suicide, and violent behavior. There are over 200 risk factors for heart disease. These include something called lipoprotein little a, it's a substance in the blood, uh, which, is, by the way, is lowered by saturated fats. Homocysteine, type A behavior, loss and bereavement is often followed by heart attack. Short stature, low birth weight, elevated uric acid, which that was found in the Framingham study. Something called C-reactive protein, which shows uh, inflammation levels. Low vitamin D is associated with uh, heart disease. Underactive thyroid, lack of exercise, obesity, smoking, snoring, baldness, hairy chest, earlobe creases, hairy earlobes. <laughs> These are risk factors. Maybe people with hairy earlobes should have their ears cut off. Being, <laughs> being poor in a rich country and being rich in a poor country. And elevated cholesterol in some population groups. These are risk factors, but a risk factor is obviously not a cause. A new way of measuring buildup in the arteries is called electron beam tomography. It's uh, very accurate and strongly correlated with as a predictor of coronary heart disease events. It's actually looking at calcium in the arteries, and this was a very interesting study that looked at LDL cholesterol versus calcium buildup, 
and the LDL cholesterol was slightly protective. So you don't have to worry about your LDL cholesterol either. So here we have the oiling of America. These are consumption trends over the last hundred years. As you can see, consumption of butter has plummeted. Very few people use lard anymore, and those who do, like the Hispanics, are constantly being propagandized by the uh, dietitians to get them to switch to vegetable oils. Shortening consumption has tripled. Now, the shortening in 1900 was made of coconut oil and lard. It was a natural product. Um, the shortening today is made with partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. Margarine consumption has gone up. And look at the liquid oils. That's the biggest increase of all. A 16-fold increase in the use of liquid vegetable oils. What do we put these uh, liquid vegetable oils on? Lettuce. <laughs> and that's why lettuce causes heart disease. I'm going to give you a very short lesson in fats so you can understand why these newfangled fats and oils are so dangerous. This is what a saturated fat molecule looks like. It's a straight molecule. They pack together easily so they're solid at room temperature. And this is what a monounsaturated uh, fat molecule looks like. They're called fatty acids, by the way. That's the technical term for a fat molecule. Uh, this is what you find in olive oil. And olive oil will be liquid at room temperature, but if you chill it down, it will get solid. So they start to pack together. There's just one little bend in the monounsaturated fatty acid. These are our polyunsaturated fatty acids. Uh, they have two or three or even more little twists in them. They're very twisty molecules, and they don't pack together easily, and that's why they're liquid even when they're refrigerated. But the important thing to understand about these types of fats is that a fat that's saturated and a fat that's monounsaturated is a stable fat. You can heat them, you can cook with them, you can expose them to air, and they don't break down. They're still safe to eat, and they last a long time. Whereas the polyunsaturated fats are fragile. And if they're heated or exposed to oxygen, as in processing and cooking, these uh, little bits get broken off. These are actually hydrogens here. Basically, they're electrons. And you're left with what they call unpaired electrons. And what are unpaired electrons called? They're called free radicals. This is a chart of the processing for these very fragile vegetable oils. Um, as you can see, this is an industrial chart. This is done in huge equipment in big factories. And all of these steps, the bleaching and the refining and the extraction and the fractionation and the hydrogenation and the deodorization involve heat. So these oils are being uh, broken down into uh, free radicals. Now, in the end, they are deodorized and you can't smell that they're rancid, but they're very, very rancid. And then we're told to cook with these oils. So you really end up with a toxic brew. And this is how I want you to think of processed polyunsaturated oils with the um, hydrogens broken off. And what you have here is like a, a dagger sticking out. <laughs> and what free radicals do is cause uncontrolled reactions in your body. And if they are going through your arteries, they will react with the surface of your arteries and cause lesions and, and problems because of these free radicals. And this is a healthy artery. It's smooth. It's, uh, it's encased in fat, by the way. This is saturated fat. This is in your heart. Uh, yeah, the heart wants saturated fat because that's where the most energy is and because it's stab stable. And this is a damaged artery. It looks sort of like fried chicken. Uh, and all of this crustiness and, and wounds and, and tears and everything, that's the kind of damage that free radicals cause. Just think of them as daggers. So many uh, diseases are associated with the consumption of these oils, increased cancer and heart disease. Several studies have shown that women who consume a lot of polyunsaturated oils have more wrinkles. Uh, they cause premature aging and they interfere with hormone production, immune system, they depress learning ability,
They cause liver damage and especially damaging to the reproductive organs and the lungs. That's where we have the greatest increases in cancer in this country. They cause digestive disorders and we're particularly concerned about what these oils do to children, impairing growth, impairing learning, probably because they actually do lower cholesterol. Here is an advertisement for a vegetable oil and you can get, if you write in, you can get a complete cholesterol depressant menu and recipe book. <laughs> Does anyone want to guess where this advertisement appeared? Uh, it wasn't in Ladies Home Journal. This was in the Journal of the uh, American Medical Association. And here's one for uh, Fleischmann's margarine, uh, claiming or creating the impression that margarine will lower blood pressure. There is not a shred of evidence that using margarine or vegetable oils will lower br blood pressure. But, uh, you know, these, these, guys has a, these guys had a lot of chutzpah with these types of ads. And let's look at a trans fatty acid um, and see what, what's going on here. This is again our saturated fat, our saturated fat molecule. Uh, the, these are carbons and these little things sticking out like ears are pairs of hydrogens. And they occur in pairs because in pairs they're stable and you can have controlled reactions. You can, chemical reactions take place in these electron clouds. This is our monounsaturated fat, and as you can see, it's missing the two hydrogens on this side, but the two remaining hydrogens at this double bond are on the same side. That's called the cis configuration, and so they also make a nice electron cloud where you can have controlled chemical reactions in your body. During the process of partial hydrogenation, one of these is moved to the other side, and it's moved across, and trans means across. That's what a trans fatty acid is. Now, your cells are covered with a membrane. Every cell in your body, you have millions of cells in your body, and every cell in your body has a membrane composed of billions of fat molecules. And at least 50% of those fat molecules need to be saturated fat for your cells to work properly. About another 40% need to be monounsaturated fat, and then the remaining 10% are a variety of polyunsaturated fatty acids. When you eat trans fats and your body digests them, it doesn't really recognize them as being foreign. It sort of thinks they're a saturated fat and it takes them into the body and incorporates them into the cell membrane. And when your body wants to make a reaction at this point in the fat molecule, instead of a nice electron cloud that allows a reaction to take place, instead there's a dead spot and the reaction can't occur. If you think of the polyunsaturates with their dagger sticking out as causing uncontrolled reactions, the trans fats block reactions. Think of your cell, every cell in your body as a, as a sphere with sparkling lights all over the sphere. Those are these little electron clouds. And when the fatty acids are in the right proportions, your cells sparkle with electric light. Now, if you start eating a lot of trans fats, instead of sparkles, you're going to have dead spots, dead black spots on the surface of your cell membrane. And the more trans you eat, the, the more poly, uh, partially hydrogenated vegetable oils that you eat with these trans fats, the more trans fats get built into your cell membranes. And the list of diseases caused by the trans fats is similar to the list of diseases caused by the vegetable oils, heart disease and cancer, degeneration of joints and tendons. This is why so many people need hip replacements today. Osteoporosis. Diabetes is caused by trans fats. Type 2 diabetes is where the receptors on your cells don't work. The trans fats interfere with receptors on the cell membrane. Autoimmune diseases, uh, skin problems, hormonal problems, and problems with growth and learning in children. And here we have the typical supermarket shelf with a few feet of space devoted to butter and all of the rest to the margarines and spreads. Now, today, of course, there's a big emphasis on low trans spreads or trans free spreads. But remember, these spreads will be made with the liquid vegetable oils, highly processed, and there'll be a lot of things in there to make those spreads stiff enough to spread, like soy protein and emulsifiers and so forth. 
But the margins and shortenings are just the tip of the iceberg because where most of these trans fats are found are in the snack foods, the crackers, the cookies, the chips, the pie crusts, the donuts. Uh, all of this processed food is uh, made with trans fats. And of course, the, the chips and the snack foods. A teenage boy can go through a package of those in about 10 minutes, especially if he's had a, a USDA-approved low-fat lunch at school and by two o'clock in the afternoon he's absolutely starving and what's left but the vending machines and so he goes through this bag of chips. Has anyone told these boys that the types of fats in these chips may prevent them from having a normal sex life? You know boys think about these things at this age <laughs> but nobody is warning them what these fats are doing to their hormones. And of course the fries, up until the early 1980s, the fried food was fried in tallow. That's the fat of bee, uh, cows or sheep. And tallow is what we should be using for fried foods. It's very stable and e even has some health benefits. But thanks to an organization called Center for Science in the Public Interest, which was supported by the soy oil industry, they lobbied to get the terrible cholesterol-laden saturated fats out of the food supply and suddenly the whole industry was using partially hydrogenated soybean oil. This is where we are. This is how most people eat today. These devitalized foods loaded with vegetable oils, trans fats, and sugar. And what's being blamed for all the disease? Saturated animal fats. Something wrong with this logic. Finally, our government has admitted that trans fats are bad. Mary has been completely vindicated. And here's what they're saying. Yes, the trans fats are bad. They're just as bad as saturated fats. So the other part of her message has a long way to go to be accepted. The saturated fats have the opposite effect as the trans fats. The saturated fats are good and the trans fats are bad. Just to give you a couple of examples here. The trans fats encourage inflammation. They cause inflammation. The saturated fats suppress inflammation. The trans fats depress the immune system, whereas the saturated fats enhance the immune system. Uh, we now know, we have lots of good science about saturated fats, and to demonize saturated fats is not just bad policy, it's actually unscientific. Uh, we need saturated fats in our cell membranes. They contribute to strong bones. They actually protect against heart disease and support heart function. Saturated fats protect the liver from alcohol and other poisons, uh, poisons in Tylenol and drugs and so forth. The lungs cannot function without saturated fats. And this is why and we have several studies on this. Children who get full fat milk and butter have much less asthma than children fed low fat milk and margarine. The kidneys require saturated fats to function, the immune system, the essential fatty acid needs, uh, acids need saturated fats to function, and saturated fats are actually part of the body's detoxification mechanism. And then we have the um, special types of saturated fats that we get in coconut oil, the short and medium chain fatty acids, which of course coconut oil has been forced out of the food supply. And accused of causing heart disease. But the types of fats in coconut oil actually give the metabolism a boost. They raise the body temperature. They give you energy. They're never stored as fat, and so they're the perfect fat for weight loss. They support the immune system, and they're involved in intracellular communication, so they help prevent cancer. All cancer patients should be on coconut oil. And finally, they have these antimicrobial components in them that kill pathogens, including candida in the gut. And recent research uh, in which Mary Ennig was involved showed that the types of fats in coconut oil are the ideal treatment for the antibiotic resistant Staph aureus, which is um, killing so many people in our hospitals. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> An old ad for lard. They're happy because they eat lard. Vitamin D in lard helps the body make neurochemicals that protect against depression. Why did we stop using lard? Because in 1913, when Crisco was introduced into the market, Crisco is partially hydrogenated uh, cottonseed oil, 
it's the shortening, uh, a, they published a cookbook. And in this book, it had all these recipes made with Crisco, including a, a recipe for a lobster bisque made with one cup of Crisco. And in the introduction, they, they basically said, and this book was aimed at women, at housewives, that um, women who used Crisco instead of lard were more scientific, they were more modern, their houses were cleaner, their houses smelled better, and their children would have better characters than mothers whose children were fed lard. So it was a very uh, interesting advertising campaign that went on for Crisco. They also, the other group that they targeted were Jewish housewives, and they said if you use Crisco, you don't have to worry about the kosher laws, and um, Mary Ennig is uh, very concerned about what this has done to the uh, Jewish population because they were the earliest to use a lot of trans fats. In the last 75 years, we've had this huge increase in heart disease and cancer. We don't know all the reasons, but one thing for sure is not butter because butter consumption has declined during this period. There are very few studies that have actually looked at diet, but one of them was published in 1965 and it looked at high-risk patients. These were people who had already had a heart attack. They were divided into three groups. One group was fed polyunsaturated corn oil. The second group was fed the so-called healthy monounsaturated olive oil. And the third group was fed saturated animal fats. Now, the corn oil group had lower cholesterol, but after two years, only 52% were still alive. 30% lower cholesterol. The olive oil group didn't do much better. After two years, only 57% were alive. I mean, these are high-risk patients now. The animal fat group had the best outcome of 75% alive after two years. And in a recent article published in the Circulation, the Journal of the American Heart Association, they basically said that uh, studies looking at total fat intake showed no significant relationship to coronary artery disease risks. Now, in these studies, they were mixing up all the fats, the good fats and the bad fats. So, but basically, they, sh they showed no relationship. Four epidemiological studies have shown no evidence that men who eat less fat live longer or have fewer heart attacks. OK, we've seen some examples this evening of how they cheat, how they manipulate the studies to get the results that they want. We've looked at a few of them, exaggerating trivial results using the concept of relative risk, using graphs with unequal intervals, leaving out data in epidemiological studies. Another one, using surrogate endpoints such as cholesterol levels rather than meaningful endpoints such as death from all causes. And believe it or not, the studies that were used to qualify the cholesterol-lowering drugs only looked at surrogate endpoints. They only looked at cholesterol-lowering. They didn't look at how many people died from heart disease. And that was the significance of the enhanced trial. This was the first study where they were actually looking at meaningful endpoints. Cherry-picking results to find chance correlations in the very large epidemiological studies. They just published the things that look, did what they wanted them to do. Changing the trial's endpoints to conform to the data received. Determining nutrient intake with dietary re recall questionnaires, which are notoriously inaccurate. Poor design of food consumption studies. For example, calling trans fats saturated fats grouping the good and fat, bad fats together, or grouping natural and processed versions of the same food together. A recent one was the um, uh, looked at um, fruit consumption, fruit and fruit juice consumption, but they included in fruit juice consumption Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's nothing, nothing you can conclude from studies like this. A lot of studies that blame meat on col colon cancer are really looking at processed meats. Confounding a risk factor with a cause. Uh, very often, the abstracts do not accurately reflect the findings. And in review articles, uh, omitting contradictory studies. So there's lots of ways that the researchers can manipulate the data and manipulate the results to get what the um, people paying for these studies want. I'll show you just one example, and this was about breast cancer. Big headlines, uh, animal fats linked to increased breast cancer risk study finds. About 
20 people sent me this study when it came out and said, see, you were wrong. So let's look at this study carefully. The newspaper articles said eating high-fat red meats and dairy products such as cream may increase the risk of breast cancer for premenopausal women. I would not recommend that diet. She was talking about Atkins diet for premenopausal women unless they replace red meat with poultry and fish. Breast cancer re risk increases 58% by eating animal fat. That sounds pretty scary, doesn't it? Remember when you see that word risk followed by a big number, they're using relative risk. And here's what they actually found. If the percentage of calories from animal fat was 0 to 14%, your chance of getting breast cancer was 0.68%. From 18 to 21%, uh, 3 percentage, uh, percentage point spread, uh, the risk was 0.88%. And by comparing these two numbers, they get this uh, very scary 58%. Then from 21 to 46%, a huge interval, it actually, the risk actually went down to 0.73%. He didn't tell you about that in the newspaper articles. So here they've taken some very trivial findings and um, you know, made them seem very scary by using this concept of relative risk. There were also twice as many smoker, smokers in the group consuming animal fat compared to the lowest. The highest interval had the greatest range and the differences were actually very small. The, actually, the higher level had lower risk than the middle level. They used two dietary recall surveys to determine fat consumption, notoriously inaccurate. And all of this was reported with great hoopla in the media, without mentioning many studying, studies showing that animal fats have no effect on breast cancer rates. So this is just an, you know, another disease, cancer, uh, but the same tricks that they're using. I took this photograph in the airport at Raleigh-Durham. Uh, this, uh, this area of the country is called the Research Triangle. This is where a lot of these studies are done. And you can imagine a, a young um, researcher has just got a grant for a million dollars in his pocket, and he's walking through the airport wondering how he's going to get the results that will please the people playing, paying for this study. And here's an ad for a company called Quintiles that does these uh, studies for them. And it says, she says, lucky you, you don't have to worry about results when Quintiles handles your clinical trial. <laughs> so the young researcher knows what she's saying. We can get the results that you want. Finally, let's talk uh, very briefly about cholesterol-lowering drugs. The types of drugs used today are called statins. All the ones that are being used are statins, and they work by uh, <coughs> reducing an enzyme in the liver to reduce cholesterol production in the liver. So Lipitor, Zocor, Mevacor, Pravacol, all of these drugs are statin drugs of, of different strengths. These statins were discovered by the Japanese who found them to be very toxic in animal trials. Uh, in fact, in every rodent study, statins have caused cancer in rodents. But the Japanese sold their discovery to Merck, a U.S. drug company, which got FDA approval with unexplained speed. They did this with studies that just used surrogate endpoints. It didn't look at meaningful endpoints. And today they are being promoted for healthy men and women categorized as at risk because their cholesterol levels are over 200. And as I said, that number gets lower and lower. Um, if you've had a heart attack and you have very low cholesterol, you're still put on a statin because obviously your cholesterol levels are not low enough. These drugs have many side effects, just a few. Fatigue and weakness, memory loss and reduced mental capacity, neuropathy and slowed reactions, muscle wasting leading to back pain and heart failure, intestinal disease, pancreatic problems, reduced libido, depression, accidents, suicide, and cancer. And if you don't believe me, go to this website called askapatient.com and put a search in for Lipitor, and you can read all of the reactions that almost every person reporting has a reaction, some of them very serious. And yet most of them are saying how pleased they are with the Lipitor because it's lowered their cholesterol. Rates of heart failure in this country have doubled since the statins have come into use. 
That's because the statins not only reduce cholesterol, but they reduce something called coenzyme Q10, which is needed for your muscles to work. And the heart is the biggest muscle in your body, the most hardworking muscle, and it does not have enough CoQ10. This also explains the fatigue and weakness, uh, the muscle wasting uh, leading to back pain. Statins also block the absorption of vitamin A, which we have seen is needed for hormone production. Polyneuropathy is a condition characterized by weakness, tingling, in the, tingling and pain in the hands and feet, as well as difficulty walking. Some people talk about the statin shuffle, this uh, very difficult uh, gait that people develop. And if you complain to your doctor about it, he says, well, you know, you're, you're just getting old. What do you expect? A lot of the uh, side effects of statins are what happens when people age and basically what the statins do is age you very quickly. And in a study done in Denmark, they found that those who took statins were more likely to develop polyneuropathy and the longer you took the statins, the more likely you were to develop polyneuropathy. We've had a lot of reports of elderly people with perfect driving records in freak accidents. We had a man in um, Santa Monica who had a perfect driving record. He plowed into 10 people at a farmer's market. He said he couldn't find the brake pedal. And his wife on, uh, said, you know, he's so healthy, he's, he's never been sick. The only thing he takes is his cholesterol-lowering drug. So we're all at risk with all of these people taking these drugs. What about your um, truck drivers? What about the pilot flying your airplane? Do you want your pilots to be taking drugs that cause memory loss or difficulty having reactions? And yet this is what's going on. The Honolulu Heart Program uh, came out with a, a, a big uh, paper in 2001. This was a 20-year study. And the researchers compared changes in cholesterol concentrations over 20 years with all-cause mortality. And I'll read you this quote. Our data accords with previous findings, previous findings of increased mortality in elderly people with low serum cholesterol and show that long-term persistence of low cholesterol concentration actually increases the risk of death. Thus, the earlier that patients start to have lower cholesterol concentrations, the greater the risk of death. Those individuals with a low serum cholesterol maintained over a 20-year period have the worst outlook for all-cause mortality. And similar findings have come out in other journals. And remember that now these cholesterol drugs are being promoted for younger and younger people, even teenagers. A meta-analysis published in 2003 looked at 44 trials involving over 10,000 patients, and the death rate was identical at 1% of patients in each of the three groups, those taking Lipitor, those taking other statins, and those taking nothing. So what good are these cholesterol-lowering drugs? They do solve one health problem, and that is the problem of cholesterol anxiety. If you suffer from cholesterol anxiety, they will lower your cholesterol. Here's an ad for Lipitor, the most widely selling statin drug, cholesterol-lowering drug, implying that even uh, young women should, uh, slim young women should be lowering their cholesterol as well as hefty guys, okay? Let's read the fine print here. Lipitor is a prescription drug used with diet to lower cholesterol. Lipitor is not for everyone, including those with liver disease or possible liver problems. How do you know if you have a possible liver problem? Women who are nursing pregnant or who may become pregnant. Now remember they're promoting this for women now, and they want these drugs to be over-the-counter drugs, which means that women who, are, uh, who may become pregnant will be taking these drugs. And these drugs cause horrible birth defects much worse than thalidomide. But here's the, here's the clincher here. Lipitor has not been shown to prevent heart disease or heart attacks. <laughs> so why, you know, why would anyone take this drug? Only because the doctors are pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. Okay, if it ain't cholesterol, what causes heart disease? 
There are many other theories proposed to explain this epidemic. Uh, there's obviously no time to go into them in detail. We start with Dr. Weston Price, who looked at heart disease and uh, vitamin levels back in the 30s. And he thought that heart disease was caused by a deficiency of vitamins A and D in animal fats. Uh, in the um, spring and fall, when these levels were high in, in the animal fats, people had less heart disease, less deaths from heart attack. But there are other good theories, refined carbohydrates, trans fats, uh, vegetable oils, oxidized cholesterol and oxidized fats, various deficiencies, including a, a very new proposition here, vitamin K2 deficiency, which is found where? In animal fats and organ meats. Uh, the researchers from Holland are predicting that within 10 years, we will define heart disease as a vitamin K deficiency because vitamin K prevents the calcification of the arteries. Heated milk protein, there's very good evidence that pasteurization makes milk atherogenic. There's a theory about homogenization in heart disease and many, many other uh, very interesting theories. One by a, a Brazilian researcher having to do with acidosis of the heart. The problem is that there's no money to explore these theories. All of the research money is funneled, funneled through the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and this agency is firmly wedded to the lipid hypothesis. So the few brave researchers who propose other theories don't get enough research money to follow through and find out if they're true. And probably all of these have some bearing on heart disease. These were Dr. Price's charts. He looked at 16 different districts. The parabola is hours of sunlight. Uh, the dotted line is levels of fat-soluble vitamins, A and D, and local butter. And the solid line is a deaths from heart disease and infectious disease in local hospitals. And there was an inverse relationship, even showing this little dip here, where the vitamins were lower in the summer, midsummer, then you got a little rise in deaths from heart attack and infection. And he found this, this pattern all over the United States. And where do we get these uh, vitamins A, D, and K uh, from our seafoods and our grass-fed land animals? All of the foods that have been demonized that we are told not to eat. The insects, uh, well, we don't eat insects, of course. Butter and cream and egg yolks, liver and organ meats and animal fats from grass-fed animals. And the latest victim to the demonization is the seafoods, which our government is warning us about as being sources of mercury. And there's actually always been mercury in seafoods. And many studies showing that people who eat a lot of seafoods have no problem with uh, mercury. So who profits? Follow the money. This is a huge industry, a huge industry that you basically are paying for. Cholesterol testing and treatment is at least $100 billion a year. These drugs are very expensive and very profitable. Then, of course, the foods that we are told to eat, the hydrogenated fats and fabricated foods, that's actually our biggest industry. It's bigger than the aerospace industry, bigger than the automobile industry. Uh, cancer and other diseases caused by these foods is another huge industry. And then, of course, very tragically, growth failure and learning disabilities in children, which takes its toll not only monetarily on our families, but also emotionally. Well, I like to cook, so I'll end with a recipe. This is a recipe for a health care crisis and enormous profits. The ingredients, as you have seen, are greed, envy, ignorance, manipulation, cunning, extortion, lies, and fraud. And here are the instructions. One, conspire to convince the populace that the natural whole foods that have nourished mankind for millennia, such as eggs, butter, whole raw milk, and red meat, are dangerous and unhealthy. Two, train the medical profession to advocate antibiotics, vaccinations, fluoride, and fabricated foods as scientifically proven methods for preventing illness. Three, ignore or suppress healing methods that work claim that real diseases have no cure or do not exist. If you're suffering from hypoglycemia or fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue, something that they can't cure with a pill or a drug, 
and you keep coming back to the doctor with all these symptoms, you know what? It's all in your head. And you're sent off to a psychologist and given an antidepressant. Finally, four, define normal human conditions such as menopause. They've made a disease out of menopause too. Define normal human conditions such as menopause and average cholesterol levels as illnesses, which must be treated with expensive drugs that create serious side effects. Then you stew, broil, half bake, or boil as the occasion requires, and this serves 300 million people, and that is the oiling of America. Thank you. Thank you. I really give Mary credit. This is her story, and she is the first author of this uh, presentation. I'm, I'm merely the presenter. She's a real American hero. So I am happy to answer questions. Um, I'll leave this up on the board. If you're wondering what to do next, uh, follow the principles of traditional diets, which uh, basically always maximize the nutrients in the food whereas modern diets are based on processed foods that minimize the nutrients in our food. So we'll take some questions. I'm confused about my oils. Uh, so grapeseed oil would be colorless or saturated, okay. correct? Which oils do you want grape me to come? Grapeseed oil, grapeseed oil. Grape oil, any other oils? Canola. Grapeseed canola, okay. Um, there's a question about some of the other oils. A grapeseed oil is quite polyunsaturated. It's highly processed. They use hexane to extract it. Uh, hexane is very carcinogenic. It's one of these processed vegetable oils. Uh, canola oil is a, um, a monounsaturated oil. Uh, the industry thought that this would be a very heart healthy oil, but when they actually tested it, it caused a lot of problems in the animals. So we don't recommend canola oil either. Olive oil? olive oil is fine in small amounts used in salads. It's what we use, but basically what you cook with should be saturated fats because the saturated fats are stable. Yes? Yeah, I just have a question. I'm, I'm looking at this, and there's no vegetables. Yes, there are. Where? Uh, where we have the vegetables? Vegetables. Yeah. Vegetables were often fermented. Um, a lot of these diets had no vegetables. Vegetables are kind of modern, really. Yeah. Uh, listen, I'm all in favor of vegetables as a vehicle for butter and cream and cooked in lard and <laughs> whipped cream. Okay, uh, this is, uh, the point that's being made here is about statins. Do they have some benefit? Because the questioner here was describing some patients who've been on statins for a long time. And what they think is that statins do have a slight benefit on inflammation. And of course, the latest theory about heart disease is that it is an inflammatory process, which is no doubt part of the picture. Uh, so th they, they do seem to suppress inflammation a certain amount, but there's so many other ways, better ways of suppressing inflammation than taking these statins. Uh, and I just, we, we hear daily from people who have had horrible experiences with the statins, but they continue because the doctors keep I insisting. Mm -hmm. my, the question is, you know, it's very hard to make recommendations when... Our questioner here is saying there's no support in the hospitals or among the cardiologists about this. Uh, there actually is one cardiologist who... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one that I know of. Um, he's in Tyler, Texas. I don't mind giving you his name. His d name is Dr. Peter Langeon, L-A-N-G-S-G-E-O-N. He takes all his patients off of statins. He puts them on CoQ10. He tells them to buy nourishing traditions and puts them on a high fat diet and, um, and he's had very, very good results. Another doctor is, uh, he's not a cardiologist, but Dr. Tom Cowan, who um, wrote the article in our journal on the, um, the um, cardiotonics that the body produces. And he puts people on uh, uh, drug, well, herbs that strengthen the heart, strengthen the heart production. I, I don't have an answer for you in the position that you're in. Um, I, I think a lot of people are trapped in the system. I think a lot of cardiologists are trapped in this system and they know that it's wrong. 
but they have no choice. And actually their salaries are based on giving out statin drugs. If they don't give them out, they, they get docked, you know, especially those in the HMOs. So it's, it's, um, the, it's really sad. I, I feel sorry as for the people trapped in the system who, who know that there's a problem and, and can't get out. And the only way this is going to change is by individuals just refusing. You know. and, and there is a lot of resistance. And, the, and the, you read about this in the articles, the drug companies in the articles saying, you know, we, we have a lot of non-compliance. We have, we have a lot of people who don't realize the danger and, and so forth. Yes, ma'am. Can I ask a question about autism? Mill does not process and receive the gut OK, this is, I'll just answer very briefly. Please uh, pick up a copy of our children's health issue and read the article by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, who treats autism by um, repairing the gut and the gut flora. And she keeps them off of milk while they're healing, but then she allows raw milk. And if you want to know where to find raw milk, contact your local chapter of the Weston A. Price Foundation. Can I get it from the dairy industry and the Great. A very good question. Uh, since I advocate butter and red meats, do we have support from the dairyman's industry and the cattle industry? No, we do not have any support from industry. Now, we have a lot of farmers who are members, and we support small farmers and some of them have given us small donations, but we do not have any support from these industry. In fact, we are the dairy industry's worst enemy because we really tell people how bad commercial milk is. We promote raw milk uh, purchased directly from the farm. On the red meat, um, we're not particularly advocating eating a lot of meat, uh, certainly not lean meat. Uh, the meat that you eat should be with the fat, and you should not just be eating the meat. You should be eating the organs, the fat, and using the, the bones to make broth. So we advocate the whole animal. But yes, and to add to that, we, we, we recommend grass-fed animal products, and we recommend buying them directly from farmers. So this is getting around those industries. Yes. Let me just say this, have, would I say that I never ate chocolate? No, I occasionally eat a piece of chocolate. But I'm certainly not recommending it as being consumed frequently. It does contain a, a caffeine-like substance and it's very sweet. So keep chocolate as a special treat. And when you eat chocolate, eat your chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what we have back here, yes. Okay, the question is that um, to infer that lowering cholesterol from statins, I shouldn't make the leap that it's bad to lower cholesterol from statins. But that's what they found. And this is what they found in the Honolulu Heart Study, that if you lower your cholesterol and you do it over a number of years, you have a greater... Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's just lowering it. And the lower they go, the, the, the more the problem. Now, uh, this um, lady is very right. Uh, low cholesterol is really a problem. Uh, you can't digest fats. You can't heal. You, you have a lot of mental problems and so forth. And it's actually much more difficult to raise somebody's cholesterol than to lower it. Um, very often, a, a very low cholesterol is a sign that something is quite wrong. It could be an infection, a hepatitis, uh, and so you have to look for what is causing this cholesterol to be so low. But, but don't you have to uh, not qualify, but also say what is normal, because there is the industry normal and yes. the medical normal, and what is normal, what should be your own genetic story, uh, when people are just tested. Right. Yeah, you know, every, everybody's different. Some people need more cholesterol. If you're in a very high stress job, you need more cholesterol and, and so forth. If you're growing, you need more cholesterol. But, you know, just off the top of my head, I'd say anything between 180 and 300 is, is normal. <laughs> but the thing is, if it's over 300, you, you really don't have to worry either. So I mean, no one should be I've never been tested. It's, it's a complete waste of time and money, you know? Yeah. What's your take on uh, HDL? Uh, uh, 
on HDL? Yeah. Well, the, um, the theory is that HDL is good and that LDL is bad. And HDL is good because all cholesterol is good. Uh, I just disagree with the part about LDL being bad. So, but yeah, HDL is, it's all good. You, that I, the question is, having a low HDL, is that related to increased risk of heart disease? I don't know. I don't know. The question is, can you rid yourself of trans fats? Yes, the body is always turning over and replacing uh, fats in the body, but the interesting thing is it takes longer for the trans fats. It takes longer for them to be replaced. They seem to be very tenacious. We're not sure why. So it might take a few years. And that's why, you know, you need to be patient when you're trying to get back on track with a, a real good healthy diet. It might take a while for all of your problems to go away. In the middle here? Well, the shortest way of putting it is eat the way your ancestors ate. And another way of putting it is eat only nutrient-dense foods. Okay, so the question is, you know, how do you condense this down uh, for non-believers, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is a wonderful teaching tool. It's our little booklet, Dietary Guidelines booklet. We've tried to fit as much information as we can in a few short pages. It's a very subversive document, actually. <laughs> And uh, this is a nice non-confrontational way to just, so you might want to read this. Yeah. Do you only recommend lacto-fermented vegetables? What about okay. fresh vegetables okay. that have the enzymes in them when they're raw? Okay, this is a question about vegetables. Do I only re recommend lacto-fermented vegetables? We love vegetables. As I say, they're a great vehicle for animal fats. Uh, the salad vegetables uh, can be eaten raw. They've been bred to be low in fiber. But most of your vegetables should be cooked. Uh, cook, there's, vegetables contain a lot of toxins. They contain blockers and goitrogens, and these are partially or fully neutralized by cooking. Uh, cooking liberates the nutrients and breaks down the fiber, which is indigestible for humans. And Dr. Price actually was very insistent upon this. He said most vegetables should be cooked. You get a lot more from them when you cook them. What about the enzymes? Don't you lose enzymes? There are not many enzymes. The question is, do you lose the enzymes? And by the way, the Weston A. Price Foundation is really big on enzymes. Uh, there are not a lot of enzymes in vegetables. We recommend what we call super raw foods, which are the lacto-fermented foods. So let's just say you're having a dinner of cooked meat and cooked vegetables with lots of butter and maybe some brown rice or potatoes with lots of butter, okay? Uh, then you would have some sauerkraut with that. And the sauerkraut is lacto-fermented cabbage. Uh, when you lacto-ferment, you actually increase the vitamin levels tenfold. Uh, vitamin C goes up uh, 10 times when you lacto-ferment sauerkraut. Um, <clears throat> and you get lots of enzymes and lots of um, good bacteria. And the other wonderful thing about sauerkraut is it helps you digest fats. So that's the way we recommend getting your enzymes. Any enzymes that are destroyed by the cooking are more than compensated for by the lacto-fermented foods. Okay, we're, we're getting off into other subjects here. The question is, what is lacto-fermented foods? Lacto-fermentation is an ancient way of preserving foods through bacteria. And the example that's best known to people is sauerkraut. Yogurt is also a lacto-fermented food. And basically what these bacteria do is increase lactic acid, and lactic acid preserves the food. And it keeps for many months this way. But also it increases the enzymes, it increases the bacteria, increases the nutrients. And almost all cultures in the world consume lacto-fermented foods. They give you stamina, they help with digestion, uh, they help you digest fats, they, they do lots of wonderful things. We're big advocates for lacto-fermented foods. In the back, the gentleman in the back. Uh, do you recommend the uh, anti-inflammation test for heart disease? You say that may be this gentleman is asking about the test for C-reactive protein. And it is, 
It is, they test for markers of inflammation. I, I think it's a fine test to take. Um, you could take that test. You can also take the, um, the uh, electron beam tomography if you're concerned about this. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that people aren't at risk for heart disease, obviously. Lots of people are at risk for heart disease because lots of people have heart disease. The point, the point of all this is it doesn't have anything to do with cholesterol. So yes, if you have high markers for inflammation, if you see, see the blockage in the arteries, you, you need to change something. And the first thing, of course, is the diet, and maybe that will make you motivated enough to get off all processed foods and get back on real foods. Let's see if we, I've answered you, so let's, here we go, in the back here. Uh, do I recommend any way to reduce plaque in the arteries? Um, I think our diet will do this. I think uh, getting on lots of vitamin K, which is in grass-fed butter, it's in organ meats like liver, cheese uh, is a great source of vitamin K. Uh, this can help a lot. We've had people t tell us that they've had these tests for artery blockage and then gone back after being on our diet, and it's better. Uh, there have even been some, uh, one or two studies which indicate, I mean, there's no complete proof that the saturated fats really do help reduce blockage. Yes? So it's not appropriate. My, my feeling on this is that if you get the person on a good diet, the cholesterol will go to the level it's supposed to be for them. And who knows what it's supposed to be? We just don't know, really. There's been so much bias in all of this that we just don't know. Okay, this is a question about people who like our message, want to eat animal foods, but the concern about the toxins in the animal foods. And toxins do accumulate in the fats. That's the fat store toxins. Uh, but, you know, the toxins are everywhere. If they're going down to the supermarket, they're getting toxins on the fruit and vegetables, they're getting them in the vegetable oils, they're everywhere. Uh, they're in the bread. There's at least 10 applications of chemicals on wheat from, from seeding to harvest, and then they're sprayed with chemicals in storage. So the chemicals are everywhere. My, my answer to that is yes, it's still better to get the fat on the meat and it's certainly important for them to eat some liver. I would get calf's liver rather than beef liver because the calf's liver is not going to be as, as toxic. Okay. And there's lots and lots of good things in liver that help your body deal with toxins. Uh, we did actually did a, an article in our magazine, it's on our website called on dioxins, which is basically what all these toxins are. And you know, your body has a mechanism for dealing with dioxins up to a certain amount. And that mechanism is vitamin A. Uh, so liver is your best source of vitamin A. And we also recommend cod liver oil. So, so we, we've always been exposed to chemicals. You know, in the past we lived in cottages with fires going all the time. And smoke is loaded with chemicals. So a healthy body knows how to deal with these chemicals, including the chemicals that would be in the fat. So it's always a balance of you know, what you're exposed to and what your resistance is. Okay, but the real change has been in the fats and oils. That has been the big change in this century. And it's much easier to stop using those fats and oils and go back to butter and animal fats than it is to give up 100% sugar. I know, it's very, very hard. Do your best because sugar is just empty calories. Uh, but I'm just thinking of what's possible for people.